Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, just wanted to say hello. Today, you know, we have some information about homeschooling. I know that right now, everyone is having lots of questions and stressing about COVID and how it's going to affect our children and our families moving forward in the fall. A lot of people have a lot of questions about homeschooling. What is it? How do you get started? Um, is it going to be right for, our, you know, our family? Can I homeschool and work? So I'm just basically here to answer questions and to give you guys a good overview of, you know, what homeschooling is and that, yes, you can homeschool. Um, anyone can homeschool their children or your children. So um, my name is Leah Walker. And um, so I'm here to talk to you guys. And I'll give you a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit about me and how I got into um, homeschooling. So I'm a mom of five. My oldest daughter is 24. And I actually homeschooled her twice in her educational career. Um, we did cyber school. So we did cyber school two times. I think once she was like in grade four. And then um, the other time she was in grade nine. So um, educating my children at home has always just been something that I felt was it's a right. It's a choice that you can make. And um, there were times where it, it was necessary for our family and I realized it and I, I went for it. And um, so, like I said, so we did that twice for her and she's since graduated from high school and, you know, she's out in the real world doing everything on her own. And the children that I have now that are homeschool age, I have a 15 year old daughter I have a 13 year old son and I have twins who are nine. And right now I'm actually homeschooling three of those. I'm homeschooling my 15 year old daughter and the twins that are not. Um, we started homeschooling, I think this was like our third full year of homeschooling. I decided to pull my 15 year old daughter <clears throat> from public school because she was having a lot of issues with like bullying, um, anxiety, the whole gamut. And I was nervous at first, but I went for it. What happened is I decided since cyber school was something I was very comfortable and familiar with, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to go back to cyber schooling. So we started to cyber school and I quickly realized right away that was not a good fit for that child. Um, she was very agitated. Um, the workload was extremely heavy, lots of busy work for her. And I imagine that a lot of you guys that are having to um, isolation school is what I call it. Your children right now could be feeling the same anxiety and the same frustration at all of the online classes and meetings and links that you have to click through. And it was just too much for her. So I decided that I was going to look into um, traditional homeschooling. I did a lot of research and I just decided, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And so we took the remainder of the school year and we kind of decompressed. We, in the homeschool world, we call it de-school. So we kind of unlearned a lot of our typical school mindset and things like that. And then we started to homeschool in the fall, which was when I brought my other children along. So that was really, it was really that was really interesting. Like I said, it was a little scary, but once we got the hang of it, I started to feel more and more comfortable. Um, so that's kind of basically how I got, how I got started. Um, just because my daughter had anxiety and bullying issues in school. And I knew that we had to do something different. So that's how we got started. Does anybody have any questions like quickly? And then if not, that's okay. I'll move on. What was the um, most difficult part of getting started with her? And like, what did de-schooling look like? So what happened is since she was already enrolled in public school, I had to, um, I had to go to the, to the school and I had to get um, an enrollment paperwork. So I unenrolled her from school and enrolled her in cyber school. And then the, the, the good thing about cyber school is they kind of take over from there. Like once you have your withdrawal paperwork and you submit it to them, they pretty much take over. They'll tell you exactly what you need. And then, you know, it's, it's pretty much out of your hands. You just, you just apply. 
Um, so that part was, was fairly easy. Now, after we were in cyber school and I decided, mm -mm, this, this ain't going to work. This is not for her. I had to then <laughs> do um, the homeschool paperwork. And we can get into that. It's, it seems like it's a lot, but it's not. I have it, it's very, it's very cut and dry what you need to do. Like, say you guys are thinking, you know what, I'm not going to have my child go back to school, you know, in the fall. I want to start homeschooling. What you want to do is you want to go to your school district you, or your, your school. You want to get the withdrawal paperwork. You want, you have to officially unenroll your child from school if they've been in school. So once you get that paperwork, once you get that paperwork filled out, what you need to do is you need to submit an affidavit. And these are, I'm going to have links and examples of everything um, ready for you guys. So you would want to, you want to get an affidavit. And I have an aff I have like a sample of an affidavit here. So your affidavit is basically going to have your name, your address, um, your phone number, your, your student's name, and it has their age. It doesn't even have their grade. You do not even have to say, you know, my child is in fifth grade or, you know, whatever. You need to have their age and their the school year. Um, and basically your affidavit is attesting that you are the parent, guardian, or legal custodian of the child, um, that you're responsible for providing them instruction. Your affidavit attests that you have a high school diploma or equivalent. Uh, that the subjects that are required by law are going to be covered. And I'm going to go into that also in a little bit. You will attest that the subjects are offered in English. That's our primary language. That's what we speak. Um, you attest that the, the child is receiving the medical care that they're supposed to have. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth about immunization records. You do not have to send the district your child's immunization record. If you attest in your affidavit that you are, you know, um, taking care of their medical needs, that is it. You do not over comply. You do not send medical records to the school. This is not like traditional school. You, you don't do that. Um, <clears throat> you attest that, uh, that there's no adult in the home that has been convicted of the criminal offenses and you basically attest that, you know, you're going to homeschool your child. Then you have to have that notarized. So I do have some contacts for some notaries because some notaries are doing like in person, some are doing distance, some different kind of notaries. But I have, um, I have a notary that will actually come to you if you don't feel like, you know, going out into the field and find it, you know, have one that will come to you. So you get that notarized. And the other thing that you would need to turn in with your affidavit that is notarized is a list of objectives. And the list of objectives is pretty simple. If you have a child that is in, say, like elementary school, <clears throat> up into, I think, grade six, there are certain things and subjects that need to be covered. And then for secondary school, seven through 12, there's a set of object objectives. All of this can be found right on the internet by simply typing in homeschool objectives. Your affidavit can be found right on the internet by typing in homeschool affidavit. The objectives, I have one here, and it's just for, it's very basic again. You don't have to go into like, you don't have to fill out like a syllabus. You don't have to have all this in English. We're gonna be learning Shakespeare and Macbeth and that is not what you have to provide you like ours just says like it has the classes english arithmetic history geography civic science safety health gym music and art one example of like um geography would be improve map skills increase knowledge of us and geography and increase knowledge of world geography it's as simple as that and again this is this is these are simple forms that can be found right on the internet that you print off and you put write together, you have it notarized, um, you can take it directly to the, the superintendent so that you can get like a receipt right then and there. 
And then that way, you know, well, they have my stuff. I'm good to go. Or you can mail it in and you can mail it certified return receipt. I personally like to do, I like to cover all bases. I email it. Um, I scan all the documents and then I send it via email. I walk it in there and I send it certified return receipt just because I'm an over, like, you're going to, you're not going to say you didn't get this paperwork because you did. So, um, but that's basically what you would do in order to get started. Um, so it's legal. nothing that you have to like think about yourself. You just find everything on the internet and then copy paste it into the document or print the document it, out. Absolutely. It's as simple as one, two, three. It is easy peasy and it's nothing to get intimidated or nervous about. Um, you can educate your child. It is just a simple matter of a couple forms, having them, notif having them notarized and getting them to the, um, the correct party. And that's basically how you would, you know, how you would get started. Um, I, now, I, I, when you get started though, you want to oh, start. Jose, were you asking something? Sorry. Yeah, because you, you, said, you said something about uh, criminal criminal background in a household? Does that count just for adults? Is that just for violent crimes or? So that's a very good question. And I don't have the, I don't have like a direct answer for you. Um, I mean, on my affidavit that I, that everyone that I've, that I've read, I'm going to read you the exact verbiage. And there's always like gray areas and this and that, but um, let me read you this verbiage. And then let's see what you think. And there's also an entity that there's an organization that represents homeschoolers. It's called the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, HSLDA.org. And a lot of people join their, um, they join the HSLDLA, whatever, so that they have like a layer of protection because sometimes things happen and you know, some school districts try to overreach. When you have the the HSLDA in your in your hip pocket, I think there's like a nominal fee that you pay every year. If you have any issues, you contact them, and then they act. It's a legal association, and they act on your behalf. But let me read you this one, just the verbiage, just so that you'll know exactly kind of what it says. It says, "No adult living in the home or or any person having legal custody of the student." has been convicted within five years of today's date of any criminal offenses enumerated in section 111 of the Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes. Now that's something that I'm sure that we could look up and possibly if we look that up, maybe it may give a list of offenses that are not acceptable, possibly. Like I said, I'm not 100% sure on that, but that's something I feel like we, we can figure out and we can post when we upload the um, video. So we'll Which start. statute again? Uh, section 111 of the Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes. So we know that's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so that's basically um, how, you know, what you would need to get started. Any questions? Any any other questions so far? It looks like it's the background check one, so it's probably just sexual offenses um, oh. offense against minors. Okay, which makes which makes a little bit of sense. Okay, so that's what you do legally to get started, and I believe that you have to have these if you're gonna start homeschooling. I think this stuff needs to be. You can file your affidavit and objectives as early as July 1st. We always start our homeschool year technically um, July 1st in our house because you just have to have 180 days of instruction. So if we start in July. We usually finish our homeschool year. I think we were finished this year. This year was a little different. I think we finished this year, um, I feel like it was like at the end of March, beginning of April possibly. Um, this is the great thing about homeschooling. You do not have to just homeschool Monday through Friday. Learning occurs every single day. Every single day that your children wake up, get out of bed, put their feet on the floor, they're gonna learn something. And so there are days that there's times where we, we did not do instruction or we didn't do anything that 
you know, I counted um, as homeschool like on a Monday or Tuesday, but maybe Saturday and Sunday, you know, we did, we did homeschool. So I counted those days. And so I actually print out a, um, a calendar and check off days. Our calendar starts July 1st and it goes to June 30th. So our school year technically goes from July. This is me in my house. Our homeschool goes from July 1st through all the way through June 30th. And the reason why I do that is because my children are special needs. They have a lot of doctor's appointments. We have a lot. We've had hospitalizations. We've had lots of things going on and we had coronavirus. So um, and it's sometimes like for December, a lot of homeschoolers will take the entire month off to do like baking and crafts and Christmas and holiday activities. So they just take that month off. When you homeschool, you can do that because as long as you have your 180 days of instruction, you're fine. So you can file your paperwork as early as July 1st, um, but I believe it has to be in, I feel like it's, Either August, I think it's August the 1st, it has to be in by August the 1st, I believe. Either August the 1st or August the 30th. I would say August the 1st, just to be on the safe side. So you want to get that in by August the 1st. There's a question in the chat that asks if you need to resubmit everything every year. Every single year. Every single year that you intend on homeschooling your children to start your homeschool, to start your homeschool year, you have to have all that stuff in. And again, it's it's like three pieces of paper, two pieces of paper. So yeah, every year you would, you would turn that in so that the, the district recognizes your home and it, they realize and they know that your children are homeschooled. Otherwise you risk truancy, which no one wants to go through that because your kids have to be enrolled. They have to be doing something. They either have to be in school, cyber school, homeschool, or like an alternative placement or whatever. So yes, you have to do that every year. That's how you get started. And um, so when you think about homeschooling, I'm curious to know like what, what comes to a person's mind? Like what comes, what's the first thing that you think of when you hear homeschooling? What are, what are your thoughts? What are some things that you've heard? What are some things that you might be worried about? Anybody have any of that? I have a question. Yes. Yes, is homeschooling referring to the biological parent only. What about grandparents or aunts or uncles or even a teacher in education homeschooled in your home or theirs? So I do know that there are people who have um, other people that supervise their home education program. Um, and the, the family may or may not pay this individual. Um, so, and I think that that is covered under your affidavit. So on your affidavit, the, the, the supervisor of the homeschooling program, as long as they are doing the, the, the you know, the, the letter of the law, not a felon or, you know, whatever, it appears that, that that's fine. I've, I know several people that say that they're, you know, that they kind of farm out what I like to call it, their homeschooling to like a grandparent or to this person, or um, there are like hybrid homeschool um, schools where kids go for like three days a week um, and then they, their parents homeschool them the rest of the, the rest of the time. Um, I know for, for us, we did a, a homeschool co-op this year and it met every other Thursday. But it was a collective. So the parents, we actually taught the um, we actually taught the, the the classes. So like I did science and social studies for like K through three. Another parent did this. Another parent did that. So we had everything set up. And like I said, so it was every other Thursday. And a lot of times people would do that because it promotes socialization. Um, you may have a subject that you're just very uncomfortable teaching or that you feel like you don't have a lot of knowledge in. And so a co-op, you know, may be a good, a, a, you know, a good choice for you. We really enjoyed it. So. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. We had another question um, in the chat about how many hours per day would you say you would spend homeschooling um, on average? And how... So how can you make it work as a single mother and around the work schedule, which I know was something that you had planned on talking about? Yes. So I absolutely love this question. Like, I love this question because 
Um, and again, my kids have been in school in a couple of years. So what's a typical school like from 7, 30, 8 o'clock in the morning to what, like three in the afternoon? I think it is. So we I have never homeschooled for that length of time, those many hours ever in three years. Um, on a typical day that we homeschool, my twins are nine. So we usually, I usually spend with them between two, three hours, probably max. They are in approximately second, third, third grade-ish. I'm, I'm thinking that's it. So when you're in school, you get off the bus, you go, you have breakfast, you have this homeroom and you have, you're, you're walking back and forth between classes. There's interruptions all day. People are getting out of their seat. The teacher has to stop and talk to this person and say, you know, hey, stop doing that or whatever. So if a class is 50 minutes, and there's been actual like studies and reports and people are saying, yeah, you know, I went and I sat and observed my children and they only had 20 minutes of direct instruction um, out of this 50 minutes, 20 minutes out of a 50 minute class times four classes, five classes. It does not take six, seven, eight hours to get through your homeschool work. You, the beauty of homeschooling is that you have your child's undivided attention it's it's you and that child or you and your children so it's like one-on-one -on -one. you can even block off like we do our work in like chunks of time my kids are not gonna sit for an hour and do worksheets or workbooks they're just not gonna do that so we may do 15 or 15 to 20 minute blocks of time throughout the day and like I said for for my nine-year-olds it's about three hours max now my 15 year old is little she she likes to take her time she's very she likes to be neat and she just really is into perfection so her day can be a little bit longer but it's kind of her choice like she wakes up later she starts her homeschool day a lot of times at like two in the afternoon she's not a morning person um there's days that she gets up early and there's days that she doesn't and we homeschool so it doesn't matter i don't as long as she's learning and she gets her work done you know, I don't care if she starts it at six and she's finished at nine. That's, that's fine with me. So, you know, for older children, because their work is a little bit maybe more intensive or, you know, they found something that they're a little bit more interested in and they can, you know, research and go for hours, their time might be longer. But for us, I like to get to the point as quickly as possible. I don't, I don't like a lot of fluff and a lot of busy work. I like, you know, if we're learning about nouns and verbs, you know, I'm not going to play, we're, we're going we're gonna to learn about nouns and verbs and we're going to have fun because my children have other interests. They, they like to do other things other than schoolwork. And that's what homeschool allows, you know, them to be able to do. So, but every family is different. There are some, fa there are some homeschool families that they have, they have a homeschool room set up like school with maps and globes and, you know, they got the papers and the books and the rulers and they are, you know, you're going to do this class for an hour, this class for an hour. And I say, if it works for them, I think that's fantastic. It just wouldn't work for mine. And how do you do the work schedule if you're a single parent at the same time? So I'm, I am a single parent. Um, it's just me and the babies. Um, and initially it was extremely overwhelming because you know, when you're a single parent, not only are you mom and, and, chauffeur and cook and everything you're now thrust into the role of teacher and that can be very difficult so I had to look at the times of the day that worked that worked well for us like I said so for my oldest daughter she's she can pretty much do her her assignments on her own um with without my help my little ones need more of my instruction so um I work out of until COVID. I worked outside of the home. I was a personal shopper for Instacart. So I was able to find a job that was flexible. So I could go out and work whenever I feel like it. So if I said, okay, you know, I'm going to do um, four hours or five hours of Instacart, we're going to do schooling when work is over or before, you know, I go, that's fine. Again, you don't have to, you don't have to wake up and start school or you can, it's up, it's up to you. Um, but if you're working at home, naturally that creates a whole different set of, you know, of problems. We're having a lot of families, the parents have to work at home and they're like, you know, 
my kid has to do all the schoolwork. They have to have these Zoom sessions and they have to do this and they have to do that. But when you homeschool, you don't have to do any of that. If your concern is how do I keep my child occupied? during the hours that I work, that's a totally different, um, that's a totally different question. Um, you know, we do a lot of, we do a lot of sensory activities for, for my boys. So I have like busy bins set up for them where they can do like Lego challenges. They, they're sensory activities. There are no mess and no like explosive science, hands on science projects that they can do on their own. They watch documentaries a lot they are heavily into documentaries and building things and coloring and so when i'm on a call or when i have to do work related things they know that they have they go over to their to their to their bins and they choose activities for this amount of time we have a timer set up and they know that this is what you're supposed to be doing because i'm going to be occupied for 45 minutes or i'm going to be occupied for one hour after that this is what we're going to do next but just because you have to work for a five-hour block doesn't mean that that's when they have to be engaged in homeschooling if your children have other interests like my son that's 13 he plays the drums now that might be difficult if you have to do zoom calls and just different things like that but if, if you know if you don't have to have meetings you know like i wasn't he's fine to to practice his drums He's fine to do this or he's fine to do that. One of my sons is heavily into like pet care. So he does, he watches a lot of like pet grooming videos and just different things like that. So when I have to work, he's exploring his interests. That's when he's doing his, you know, his stuff. When I finish my, um, you know, my call or, or my work that I have, that's when I say, okay, let's go ahead and start this schooling. Or there's times when I'll give instruction um, educational instruction, like say we're doing, we're learning multiplication or we're learning this. I might say, I'm going to take 30 minutes or 20 minutes and give this instruction. And then for 20 minutes, this is what you're going to do while I have to do 30 minutes of work or whatever. So it's just prepping. It, it's, it can be done. There's times where it's a lot of planning, a lot of planning, you know, goes into it at times, but it can be done. You just have to think outside the box and realize that just because you work from nine to five or nine to three, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be engaged in school. Well, I would like to ask, if you're trying to do education in your planning, how do you integrate socialization? Because the flexibility that you're talking about and sometimes they're isolated and you don't see the events or the things that you do in social play or group play. How do you teach the interaction of self-discipline and the flexibility that you're talking about? Absolutely. So prior to COVID, COVID has everyone out of sorts. So prior to uh, COVID, socialization had never, ever been Um, a huge, a huge issue for us. I know that that's something that a lot of people worry about, you know, well, I want to homeschool, but, you know, I'm worried about socialization. I'm worried that my kids aren't going to have friends. I'm worried that, you know, you know, I don't want my kids to be in the house, you know, all the time. So prior to to COVID, um, we were homeschoolers, but we were hardly home. In Pittsburgh and the surrounding areas, there are a multitude of homeschooling, different homeschooling groups, different homeschooling co-ops, and different homeschool events. The libraries all around the city of Pittsburgh have homeschool like mornings and afternoons where other homeschoolers get together and they do activities. There is a gym in Carrick called the Phillips Rec Center. Every Friday they had homeschool gym. Urban Air does like a homeschool jump. Um, the citizen science lab, the, 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 um, every, every place, even the aviator, they have like homeschool groups and homeschool classes. So we never lacked for socialization ever. We have friends who they do a lot of, um, karate, like karate is something that their family is like heavily into. So just because they homeschool, their kids still take karate classes. My, my children did project art. Um, a couple years ago, and they loved it. And they went, I think it was like twice a week they went. Um, so they had art classes. So they 
they didn't lack socialization and they still got that experience of sitting in a classroom because people always say that, well, I don't want to homeschool my kid because they won't know how to sit and attend. They won't know how to uh, respect a teacher or they won't know how to do this. Well, homeschooling doesn't mean that you keep your kid in a box. It doesn't mean that you just learn in the house all day and you never go outside. The world is your is your curriculum the world it's it's, there's a whole wide world out there and we were determined to conquer all of it now with COVID it has definitely been challenging because where is there to go the libraries aren't open it wasn't safe to go to the parks and it wasn't safe to do this it wasn't safe to do that so what happened is it was good that we had actually done co-ops and had friends because we had to rely on technology to kind of keep them you know, engaged and linked up with their friends. And it was different, but that's the same thing that kids, you know, that went to public school were facing. And everyone always says, you know, homeschoolers aren't, you know, social, there's no socialization and different things. But I have to tell you, the whole time I was growing up, I was told that we didn't go to school to socialize. When my mom told me, I don't send you to school to socialize. I send you to school to get a learning. That's what she told me. So in the socialization that occurs in school, a lot of times it's very it's very directed it's very you can only socialize at lunchtime and now a lot of schools have quiet lunch so they're not even allowed to socialize at lunch so you know that's difficult and as far as like the self-discipline that is trial and error and frankly to be honest with you it comes with like practice and practice and it like I said it's not always easy there's times where my kids know exactly what they should be doing or what I expect from them but they're nine they're kids and they will test the boundaries and they will test those waters every time so that's when you have to say you know well these are the consequences this is what you're supposed to do this is what you're supposed to be doing these are my expectations and if you're not following them if you're not doing ABC these are the consequences and stick to them Okay, you have what you call, I mean, what is called your history of the self homeschooling. And you have, you know, some kind of uh, past experiences. What about the new parent doesn't have all that, doesn't have anything to do with the libraries and all those things? Are those um, referrals or resources you gave initially can help them? Absolutely. And again, any, anyone can homeschool. You just have to have the desire to do so. One of the things that I strongly encourage families to do when they decide that they really, really are, you know, um, thinking about homeschooling and they want to do it, we spoke about de-schooling. So what de-schooling is, is you take a chunk of time. A lot of veteran homeschoolers recommend that for every year, that your child has been in school, you de-school for one month. Now, I understand that that seems like so foreign and so, oh my goodness, my child is in the fifth grade, so we're going to spend five months like not doing anything. That's not what de-schooling means. De-schooling simply means that during this time, you learn your child. You, you have to learn, how does my child learn? What are they interested in? How can I teach my child? And you'd be surprised. A lot, of pe- a lot of people think that you have to be like a, a road scholar in order to teach your child. You're, the goal of homeschooling is not to teach your child everything they should know. There's no way you're going to do that. I graduated with high, from high school in 1992, and I didn't know everything. <laughs> Everyone graduates from high school, and you, you, you keep learning. You're, you cannot teach your child every single thing that they need to know. What you want to do is teach them so that they can learn to love getting the information and get, learning how to get it for themselves. That's my job. Is to, is to, my job is to teach them to learn to love learning, if that makes sense. I want my children to have interest and seek the knowledge on their own. I want them to be able to say, hmm, I like history, but this is the kind of history that I like. I can provide you with you know, through the library, some books and materials. And guess what? It's up to you now. It's, it, it's up to you. So no, you don't have to know every single subject. The other thing that happens is you learn right alongside your, your child. I don't, I didn't remember a lot of historical facts and, and dates. I remember events and just different things. But as I'm lear- relearning it again with my children, 
I'm starting to remember certain things and it's coming back and I'm, and I'm learning like new things like, Oh my goodness, you know, I, I really didn't even know that. Or maybe I learned it and forgot. I don't know. So you don't have to be uh, well-versed in, in every single topic. You just have to have the desire to, to want your, your children to learn. And there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can, that you can get your children information. We don't do tech. We don't do textbooks in here. We don't, you know, I don't, I hate textbooks. I'm not, I, I'm not going to sit down and read a textbook from, you know, the first page to the last page. I don't, we don't do a lot of workbooks and worksheets. We do a lot of hands-on experiments, hands-on learning. Like I said, my kids like a lot of documentaries and they love living books. That's how they get a lot of their information. So if you don't know a lot about history, but you want to teach like African-American history, History or, or U.S. history, you don't have to get a textbook. You can go right to the library. You can go right online. Ask Libby, Hoopla, Amazon Unlimited, Scribd. There are so many different apps and, and places where you can get free books and, and free, you know, a material to read. And we just simply Google or put in, well, we want to learn about X, Y, Z. This is what our history class is going to consist of. We read living books. We read a lot of autobiographies. And we watch a lot of documentaries and that's Here's how they get the and they return it. living books, living books, living books are books about a topic. It's not a textbook. Like you might say, you know, um, we're supposed to be learning about X, Y, Z. Uh, we have to learn about this. One of the, one of the things that one of the books that my daughter read about, uh, was about Anne Frank. So instead of textbooking it, guess what I had her read the diary of Anne Frank. She wanted to watch documentaries. She wanted to do this. And so we didn't go and say, you know, we need a textbook. It is a book about the topic. It's, a, it's like a, a storybook about, you know, a historical event or, you know, whatever. There's living books about science. So it's not a textbook. It's like a, it's like a regular book that you read about um, science, astrology, meteorology. It's not a textbook. It's a book that talks about stars and lights and constellations and, and all that stuff and it still has factual information and it's more interesting for a lot of children than your dry run-of-the-mill textbook does it matter how they get their information if they learn it and they remember it and they can teach it back to you does it matter if it's in a textbook or a worksheet not really for those parents that are a little bit worried about going on their own um, is there or are there homeschool curricula that you recommend or you can tell them where to find curricula? So yes, and so this is another interesting thing. There are parents who spend a lot of money on curriculum. I was one of them. So when I first started homeschooling, I had a thought in my mind about how I figured it was going to go. I pictured a classroom of and kids in it and happy and learning and you know chalkboard and, and all this and books and so I bought that I bought the maps I bought the globes <laughs> I bought all the stuff I bought the curriculum I spent a lot of money on textbooks and books that's sitting downstairs collecting dust because they hated every minute of it but that's just my children but there are there's curriculum that you can buy in box sets there are websites that you can go on that have like full curriculum. Um, one site that comes to mind that I know that a lot of homeschooling parents use, you pay for some of these that you pay for. There's a uh, website, it's called Time for Learning. You pay like every month for that. A lot of parents like that. We tried it, I hated it. There, and a lot, of, a lot of websites where you can get like curriculum that's like online, they usually will offer free trials. So Time for Learning is one that's like all encompassing. It has like language arts, math, science, social studies, um, it, and it has all that. There's a couple free ones that a lot of people flock to. One is called Discovery, Discovery K-12. It's not K-12. It's not the one that you have to enroll your child in. It's like a charter cyber school. It's called Discovery K-12. That's a free one. There's another curriculum that is online. It is totally free. And a lot of people speak very highly of this. It's called Easy Peasy. It's totally free. And it covers 
kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. So you can use that website for your all of your homeschool needs. I'm told it's very um, comprehensive. A lot of people absolutely love it. They, you know, speak highly of it. There is a, um, there's another curriculum that you can use this online. And I know that a lot of schools use these material, these, use these materials. It's called Core Knowledge Foundation. I've used some of their resources because I like their stories and some of how like their language arts is set up. Um, that's another good one. You have to decide if you want to teach like a secular curriculum or if you want to go like Christian or biblical, you know, there's different curricula for that. Some of the curriculum that's out there is very, very, very expensive. And like I said, and I, 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 I bought some and my kids did not like it. So I more so piece things together. There's a website called Teachers Pay Teachers and it has a lot of, um, free materials on there like if you want to learn if you're if you're teaching about say um electricity or bacteria um you know for science whatever you can go to teachers pay teachers you can put that in the subject line pick the grade mm -hmm. click free and it'll pull up the free resources free resources for that so basically um you can you can decide you know i'm, I'm gonna go ahead and pay for a curriculum and that's fine, a lot of people do, and it works fantastically for their children. Or you can say, you know what, um, I'm gonna go with the free stuff. There are books, a lot of people are worried about keeping their children in line with uh, public school. So there are books that you can check out from the library or look online to find out like what your second grader should know. And these books will outline everything that is usually taught in the second grade, what your third grader should know. The, you know, or what your eighth grader should know or whatever. And it tells you what's taught. So you can take that book, see what they should know and piece your curriculum together, you know, from, from that book. If you're concerned about keeping your children on, you know, on grade level, I'm not, but a lot of people are. So that's important to know. For one last question for me. Now, when you get to the end of your school semester, on monitoring and observation, how do you grade by point or by observation? How do you very, score? Very good question. So we don't even use grades. Um, you can, you can use grades in your, your home school. Like if you say this year we did English, we did math or whatever, my children followed this book. You know, we had these worksheets or I gave them problems. They consistently scored eight out of 10 or whatever. I felt like, you know, you could, you can grade them just like teachers grade in school. Um, we don't, we don't do that, but people do. To wrap up your home school year, and this is really, really, really important. So in order to wrap up your, your home school year, there's, certain, there's a, there's a legal way that you have to do it. So you have to put together a portfolio. In the state of Pennsylvania, your portfolio has to, is supposed to show progress from the beginning of the year to the end. So what I tell people, if you have a child that does, you know, worksheets or whatever, take some of their um, samples of work that they did from the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year in the subjects that they learned, put it in a folder, and that can be, you know, part of their portfolio. So you keep, you get, you get a portfolio together and you have to have their portfolio evaluated. Once you start homeschooling, I strongly suggest that you seek out homeschooling groups on Facebook, other homeschoolers or whatever, because there are going to be a wealth of information, you know, for you. We have like homeschool evaluation days where they, we meet at Highland Park and homeschool families come, you bring your portfolio, and there is a certified evaluator. An evaluator, I think, has to, okay. has to either be like a teacher, that's like a certified teacher, a school psychologist, and there's like one other, I think there's another certification that would qualify for somebody to be a, an evaluator. So what the evaluator does is they look at your portfolio, mm -hmm. and they say, oh, you know, and it's, it's not like they're scrutinizing every little thing. They're just looking to say, oh, you know, there was progress made this year. They, they learned something. I could see that they learned, you know, at the beginning of the year, their handwriting was this way. I see the progress, you know, they, they did it, we're fine. The evaluator <clears throat> then uh, generates a letter saying, you know, I evaluated this family, this child, 
I'm satisfied with the progress that they made for the school year 2019, 2020. Right. You, that's what you submit to the district. You do not submit the portfolio, only the letter from the evaluator. Oh. So also in grades three, five, and eight, they're supposed to take standardized testing. Grades three, five, and eight. Right. These testing, you can go right on the internet and put in, uh, I think if one is the California Achievement Test, there's a link, there's a site, I think the test is $25. Um, there's a timed and there's an untimed version. You can take the untimed version if you want to or the timed version if you feel like it. After you take the test, the results are available. You print out the results. You put that in your portfolio. Only your evaluator sees those test scores. You do not send that to the, to the district. Your evaluator is not going to say, I evaluated this family and this little boy didn't do well on the testing because some kids don't and that's not a great indicator of what a child knows or doesn't know in a lot of instances so that is one of the that's how you wrap up your school year you have to have an attendance log um that's why i just print off a calendar and check off the days i put that i put their work and um you have to have um uh, I, I include like a reading log. A reading log is very easy. Every time your child reads a book, you can have them write it down. Or if you're like me, we do a lot of books from the library. <clears throat> so if you use books from the library, you can go on the library, pull up your history, and it'll, it'll show you all the books that you checked out. We just simply print that list off. But I also, I don't do paper, um, I don't do a paper portfolio. We take a lot of pictures all school year. All school year, if we go somewhere, if we're at the library and we're doing an activity, if my kids are doing science projects at home, I'm videotaping it. If we go to the zoo and they're feeding animals and brushing and combing and climbing and riding horses, I video it. I created a Facebook, a, a private Facebook group for that purpose. I upload all of their stuff to there and that's what I submit to the evaluator. I just simply give my evaluator access to that Facebook page. Bam, bam, bam. Here you go. It's lovely. You know, you don't even, some evaluators are like, I can do distance eval. So that just means you simply give them access. They look at your stuff. They generate the letter. You submit it to the, the, uh, to the district and your year's over. All right, thank you very much. We had a question. And again, about and again the feel free to, there, we're gonna, we're gonna have, I'm gonna have them put um, my, you know, email in there because I know this is a lot of information and there's gonna be like gaps and you guys are probably still gonna have questions, but feel free to email or, you know, whatever your question is. Any person that like this, like homeschooling, we are always so willing to help other families because it can be a lot. It can be very overwhelming in the in the beginning, but it it ends up being so easy and so much less than what you really think it is. Yeah, so I'll take I'll touch on the the questions as well in the box. I just feel um, I want to say two things. One. Um, I think that what you were talking about with the testing is something that more and more parents are starting to worry about is the consequences of the testing, both in terms of stress and also in terms of the student's privacy long term and, and you know what happens if school systems are hacked or whatnot. So um, the homeschooling does give an answer to that. Um, secondly, I wanted to say, yes, join a homeschool group. I've been part of Facebook groups for seven years and they are very helpful. So Look for, look for Facebook homeschooling groups because they will help you to get things done. They can, there are ones for Christians, there are ones for Muslims, there are ones that are African-American, you know, specified. So look for those homeschool groups because um, they can help you a lot. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, in the questions box, uh, we have a question about textbooks in schools. And I think that in general, we wanna know what's the relationship between schools and homeschoolers because I believe in Pennsylvania, um, homeschoolers still have access to extracurricular activities at the schools. Um, so, but do homeschoolers have access to the actual textbooks that are used at schools? Good question. So, <clears throat> textbooks at schools. I'm challenging you to think about this. For everyone that has children in school right now, do they use textbooks at your child's school? Probably not. I'm, I'm going to venture to say I probably not. So 
I've homeschooled my children in two different school districts. We started out in the Stowe Rock School District. We are now in a totally different county in a, in a different school district. Neither one of those schools have textbooks. So they are supposed to, by law, um, offer you access to textbooks. Some people say other materials. They never offered nothing. Um, I thought at one point it would be really nice if I could have like um, a lot of schools, their kids do like uh, spelling city and reading eggs and stuff. And I thought that the school would be nice and give us the code so that, you know, we could use those, <laughs> we could use those websites and things like that for free. And I was told absolutely not. And that's fine because when I started thinking about it, if the school has if you're using Reading Eggs or Spelling City or Dropbox or IXL or Moby Max through the school, they also have access then to your to your child's progress scores, et cetera, which is what I, I don't want. So that was fine. Now, as far as the um, extracurricular activities, yes, they are absolutely supposed to allow your children to participate in those activities. Some districts are really fantastic about allowing that. Others, not so much. There is a loophole. There's a way that they have gotten away from having to provide that. If the instruction is like during the day, like say you want your child to uh, take band with the, the middle school. If a lot of schools, if, if that band class meets during the day, they'll say, no, sorry, you can't just know because that's not extracurricular. It's like during the day and blah, 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 blah. And so they simply, you know, be like, no. But then there are some, some schools and some districts that you know they they're very accommodating so it every district and every school is so different so you know again that's trial and error and i always tell people ask ask i'm, I'm always one that i'm gonna ask and if they say no well they say no and if i want to fight then we'll fight but i'm gonna ask so but they absolutely are supposed to allow you to participate in the extracurricular activity. Like I said, as far as textbooks, good luck with that. Because I ain't seen a school use a textbook in about five years, 10 maybe, I don't know. Um, and just before you go, can you clarify, um, do you choose the evaluator or does the school district choose one for you? These are your children. We are homeschooling. You choose everything. You choose what they learn, when they learn it. If you decide that your child isn't ready for multiplication in the second grade and you feel like they would benefit from waiting two years and you teach it to them then, that's what you do. You choose the evaluator. You choose the evaluator. And if you meet with an evaluator and you're uncomfortable with the questions that they are asking you and you, they, you're, they're looking at you and they're giving you pushback, you know what you say? Get my stuff back. No, thank you. Mm -mm. No, you choose the evaluator. You choose. And again, they're, the evaluator is simply looking for progress. They're not looking to, they're, they're not supposed to be interrogating your children. They're looking for progress. That's it. It's as simple as that. And what I don't want people to do is over comply and start giving uh, information and giving paperwork that is not necessary. You don't, you give what the law tells you. This is what you do in order to homeschool. You provide that and be on your way. Thanks. Most homeschoolers are, we're, we're really, really strict with that because we don't want, we don't want overreach. We want to be able to continue to educate our children the best way that we see fit. All right. One more question about the financial commitment. Now and then we have to wrap this up. up. <laughs> One more, please. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If you have what you already pay in your school taxes, does any of this money go towards the homeschooling? Not a dime. You can't, you cannot, you cannot receive any money back. Um, you can't put it on your, you know, tax, but not, nothing. No. And the, and the thing is, once the, once, you, you know, you want to be careful. That's a very slippery slope. Once they start paying you to educate your children, they're going to start telling you how you can educate their children. So I'll tell them they can keep their money and we'll do, we'll use the free resources that we got to. You don't get any money for homeschooling. In other states, they have umbrella schools that pay for certain things, but not in Pennsylvania. All right. Thank you very much for your You're questions welcome. answered. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate that.
All right, I think um, we're, we're out of time at six o'clock. Are there any final comments you wanna tell people how they can reach you, where they can find more resources? And I know Kiyomi's gonna send a follow-up email with all the resources you've already provided. Absolutely, I, you know, I can be reached. My email address is lwalker3106 at comcast.net. You can reach out to me via email. We can talk. We have coronavirus, so can't meet up with you face to face. But we can do we can do a Zoom session or Facebook or you know whatever. And I can continue to try to answer any questions you have. I can provide you with the um, the papers that you need, like the affidavits and the objectives and different things. I can I can personally walk you through what you need again to get started. Um, we can talk about different curriculum choices and everything. Like I said, just because I don't do it in my homeschool doesn't mean it won't work for you. I, my children have just a different set of needs. So we homeschool, we actually do something un, that's called unschooling. Maybe one day we can get into that as a, um, as a, a session, but I'm always, I'm always open and willing to talk about homeschool because I absolutely love it. So. Thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Kiyomi, you want Thank to close you. us out? Yeah, that sounds so good. Thank you so much for coming and spending time with us and sharing all that information. Um, I will send a follow-up email to everybody um, and definitely share Leah's um, email so that you can contact her directly. So, Great job. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.